title of this message is God's Economic Love and Charity. God's Economic Love and Charity. God's Ways Work. We mentioned in the podcast, and those who might see this on the internet later can go to the podcast we talked about God's, uh, the Bible, and economics. You'll see we discussed the Jubilee year where every 50 years all property went back to the original family so that you wouldn't have overlords who owned vast stretches of land and a whole bunch of peasants. And that's what most of the world was probably up until not all that long ago. Most of the world lived that way. Under various, they had different titles and overlords, but you get the general, you know, idea of it, and, and poverty. But in Israel, no matter how bad they managed their land, what bad breaks, every family got their land back. All debts were, were forgiven every seven years, and then anything left over, and prisoners who were working on farms, working off sentences, were all freed. They had no prisons, and then. And, Everything, everybody was freed in the 50th year, the Jubilee year. It was good for society. It kind of leveled society. Just to give an example, even many centuries later when King Ahab wanted a vineyard, um, he couldn't have it. Even though he was king, the guy said, this has been in our family, whatever, many generations. I'm not giving it up because the king wants it. And, and Jezebel said, aren't you the king of Israel? What do you mean you can't? Get a vineyard in any pagan country that would have been unheard of. It's just well, anyway, she, she did her legal means to do what she wanted, and that and, and, and God put a curse on her, which is another story. But the, the point is, um, Israel was different in that way, and all that you'll see in Leviticus 25, Deuteronomy 15. They couldn't even charge interest when they loan money to the needy. Uh, uh, God's ways worked. Well, in 1991, the communist empire fell. And reading a book about a man whose family was, they were a committed American communist, they didn't give up their idealism of the communist utopia. Uh, they realized communism now had a bad name. They changed their name to progressives. And one of their new buzzwords was social justice. And I read his, the book came out before all this latest wave of stuff in 2020, so uh, they started this back years ago. And various socialists, humanists, atheists, um, they have created what they call the religion of man. The man can solve all his problems as opposed to the religion of God. Um, and they view people as good. And it's just society has got some corpse in it, and once they straighten out society, people will be, it'll be utopia. The only problem is the Judeo-Christian Bible says that people are not good. I'm not saying people don't have a good side, but the Bible teaches that all are sinners, and human nature has its selfish side. And I know it, it, it shows in different ways in different people, but that's a different view of society. And God says uh, people need laws, regulations, rules. It's sort of like I was listening to uh, this TV show. A young lady was talking about how they go to these high-end stores like Nordstrom out in California on the coast. And they come like 40 people. They do smash and grab. And they're, they're not starving for bread, in case you hear that. So they're after expensive purses, jewelry, high-end stuff, and they're smashing cases. And the way the law is in California, if they can't prove you stole over a thousand bucks, it's it's not a felony. You don't get punished. They don't even do anything to you. And they're now taking advantage of that. And she says, "Well, why do I go to Nordstrom and pay for my stuff? Why don't I just grab it and and walk out the door like everybody else?" She says, "Because I have morals." But you realize that there are a lot of people who don't have morals? If they think there are no consequences, they will steal? Uh, I could go into the details, but you get the general idea. The communist empire murdered over 100 million people, most in Russia and China, but in a lot of countries. There's a long list of their atrocities. And what they end up creating was a lot of poverty and a police state. 
It didn't actually work. But somehow their proponents still believe in it. And they would say, well, the wrong people were in charge. But if good people like us, as smart as we are, we can make it work. No, they can't. It's God's ways or you end up with a police state and poverty and all kind of mess. Um, we worshipers of the true God, we realize the truth about human nature. And our human nature, too. We need to, The one thing I think about when you get converted... You use God's Holy Spirit to help you resist your human nature and pull yourself back toward godly behavior. I know it's ups and downs, and some days are downs, your human nature wins, but, but you're in that battle, and you can see, as you grow in the years, you can see your human nature more clearly. You don't have any illusion like, I'm really good. And anything bad I've done, I have a justification for it. You ought to hear some thieves justify their stealing. Well, it's reparation. Or I had a bad childhood, or uh, the phone company's been ripping us off, or big corporate, you know, you can come up with a thousand excuses to steal, right? Or to do all kinds of other bad stuff you want to do. But instead of just admitting, um, God says we shouldn't hate, we should love our enemies, all those wonderful Christian principles in God's ways. Uh, by the way, you know, the pilgrims gave up a communal living. They tried that for the first year or two in the great dark forest of New England all by themselves and they went to capitalism. And give them credit, they laid the foundation for the most successful economic country in the world. People might criticize the pilgrim, but they succeeded. We're enjoying, and they're the first ones that said government by the people. Because when the captain dropped them off in uh, Plymouth Rock, he said, well, uh, I'm... <laughs> I'm not taking you down the coast. It's too dangerous where you want it to go. And I'm going right back to England. You're on your own. But who's going to be in charge? The captain said, that's not my problem. Boom. Here's your stuff. You're stuck here. Uh, and and they were, it was late in the fall. You know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a scary story in a way. But they survived. And they elected their own leader. And that started the American tradition of government by the people. Um, <clears throat> But in worshiping the true God, we have to recognize mankind. Now, I want to look at Deuteronomy 15, 11. And one of the things that God said that I want to focus on just briefly this afternoon, God said in Deuteronomy 15, 11, and the context is even more, but he said, the poor will always be in the land. Now, he had just said that if you do everything right, there will be no poor. But God is, you know realistic to realize, yeah, but that's probably not going to happen. Bad management, bad luck, and people don't obey God. I mean, God knew that too. So you always have poor in the land. So I tell you to be free in giving to your brother. Some more exotic translations say you should have more of an open, loving heart to your brother, to those in need, and to the poor in your land. So what God was recommending, and apart from all those other laws of protecting the family property, he was saying, charity, charity, be open to your brother. And even if you get close to the year of release, he said, well, if I loan him some money now, <laughs> all debts will be canceled in six months. God said, don't think that way. Go ahead and help the needy with charity. Don't worry about it. The way it's written up, God says, I'll bless you, just be charitable. Do you know what the most charitable nation in the history of the world is? Far and away? Well, you probably already know it, the United States of America. And you might say, well, some of that's because America has more money. That may be part of it, but it's more than that. Um, and actually, I've written articles from foreign countries who studied it. America far outstrips the world in all kinds of gifts to the rest of the world. Now, it's not even close. Because I think America, let's say the Judeo-Christian ethics from the Bible, has been in American history that Americans know enough to be charitable. All kinds of churches. You might even disagree with them on this doctrine or that doctrine, but almost all of them see Christian charity as a good thing. I believe America has been blessed in part because of our charity. We're doing what God wants done. 
be charitable. I know there are problems with charities, and I'll mention that a little bit later for a moment, but I just want to mention that. Proverbs 31, 17. Now, this is what's called the noble wife. At least that's what some Bibles listed it. And, and you'll see it in, in your Bible in different categories as the noble wife. She puts a band of strength around her and makes her arm strong. She sees her marketing is of profit to her. So she's buying and selling and making profits for her family. And, and the Bible praises her. Her light does not go out by night. She's working hard to take care of her family. And when you read the context, she's giving them warm clothes in the winter and all that sort of thing. Verse 20, her hands are stretched out to the poor. Yes, she's open-handed to those who are in need. Notice, not only is she successful in taking care of her family and marketing and buying land and all those things that are mentioned, she's also generous to the poor. It's like God says, do both things. Work and take care of your family, you know, and, and profit, which means, you know, smart business things like savings and not wasting money and, uh, you know, a lot of the things that being thrifty, but also taking care of the needy. God wants us to take care of the needy, to be uh, generous in our giving. Um, so... God is saying, be like the noble wife. She made money for her family, but she helped the needy. Um, how many of you remember Jack Benny? We see a reasonable number remember Jack Benny in this audience. We're not as young as we look, right, and think. Well, this criminal comes up to Jack Benny, and he sticks his rifle in Jack Benny's ribs, and he says the famous line, your money or your life. He says it again. Your money or your life. And Jack Benny remains silent. He said, Didn't you hear me, idiot? I said your money or your life. And Jack Benny says, I'm thinking it over. I'm thinking about it. <laughs> he was super cheap. Super cheap. Um, well, He was the opposite of being generous. Actually, in real life, uh, actually, I read a book, Jack Benny story. In real life, he really wasn't anti-charity. But it was a great, in, 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 in thrifty America, especially even later during the Depression years, that was a great stick for him. He was, actually, I think he was the master, according to his book, of Sunday nights, when I forgot whether it maybe a 7 o'clock slot, for many years, was it during the 20s, 30s, 40s, and part of the 50s, it was the Jack Benny hour, and he was that big. He got a big chunk of the audience all those years, but it was a great stick for him. Um, but we do need to think of others. God wanted to create a caring, moral community. Now think about what God wanted. God wanted to create, among his people, Israel, a moral, caring community. Um, actually, I've got some good neighbors that, uh, I'm not saying we have a moral caring community, that might be an exaggeration, but the neighbor next door, Rocky, uh, we had the frozen, my driveway has a little bit of a hill, and uh, it was frozen for about 10, 11 days last February. I went out there once and tried to do a little something. I slipped and fell. It was a good fall, nothing broken. I said, no, nah, with my uh, bad hip, I can't afford it. my age. So I went back in the house and said, I'm just not kidding now. I think it was the next day or the day after that. Rocky was out there busting it up, and he did my whole driveway. It was really bad weather. And I said to him, I said, I know you're not doing this for money. I mean, I would have paid him if he had said so. By the way, something I noticed years ago, there were teenagers would run around. You could pay them to shovel your driveway, do other things for you for 20 bucks. But that doesn't exist anymore. Either there aren't enough teenagers or they don't need the money or their home plan or devices. They're just not there. Uh, the hire to do stuff, at least where we are in Cape. Uh, but that's a good neighbor. And my two younger neighbors across the street last year did our leaves for us. We had a lot of leaves. Uh, they moved them to the curb where they suck them up. Uh, this year, the guy we hired to do stuff did it for us. But, but 
which is good. We didn't have to worry. But that's being good neighbors. You see what I mean? Uh, like I know one lady left her purse twice in a grocery cart, and good neighbors saw to it that it was gotten back to her. Now that's a good community. And I think we're getting less and less of those communities. I remember back east, we went to Walmart back east. And there's so much thieving that when you go out the door, they have two people, and they go through your little printout slip to be sure that you pay for everything that's in your cart. It slows you down. I think their prices are a little higher, too. Just one more hassle. Because in their community, stealing is, what can I tell you? Not, Walmart's not doing that for nothing. You see what I mean? And here in Cape, there's a little of that, but not that much because the community hasn't gone down yet. I'm saying that yet. <laughs> I, I do see bad trends, but that's what God wants, a community where people take care of each other, they're reasonably honest, and, uh, and they guard each other's private property. I'm going to go to Deuteronomy 22.1. Deuteronomy 22.1. And these aren't the only verses, but, but these are the key ones. Deuteronomy 22.1. If you see your brother's ox or his sheep wandering, do not go by without helping. You could just say, well, that's his problem. I'm not stopping. By the way, nowadays, some people have stopped to help, and they got sued. That's how our legal system actually undermines helping other people. I'm not making that one up. That, I thought that was the craziest thing. You help somebody, and if it doesn't go well, they can sue you. I mean, it's crazy. But our legal system is part of our problem, and law schools are part of our problem. Do not go by I without helping, but take them back to your brother. If their owner is not near, or if you're not certain who owns it, then take the beast to your house. Keep it till its owner comes and search for it. Then you're to give it back to him. Verse 3. Do not... Keep it yourself. Verse 4, if you see your brother's ox or as falling down into a hole, you're supposed to stop and help him. In other words, maybe his ox cart, the axle is broken in the, and the ox has fallen into the hole, or whatever it is. Do not go by without giving him help and lifting it up again. Now, we would probably call that a good Samaritan law. But God required the Israelites they weren't to bypass their neighbor who needed help. You're supposed to help him. A good Samaritan law. That's what the world needs. And uh, people say, well, it's up to the police or the emergency rescue fire department to help him. Uh, can you see that's not the best? By the way, and the best society to fight crime, disorder, and all kinds of things is if people help each other, and turn in the bad guys. Societies where they don't do that or are afraid to do it, well, some big cities are seeing it now, chaos reigns. God's ways are to protect your neighbor's property as an individual. And I say, well, I pay taxes, and so-and-so's agency will take care of it. But God said, as an individual, you should protect your neighbor's property. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, by the way, a lot of the writings of Paul had to do with uh, a charity for the uh, starving saints in the Middle East. There was some kind of drought. We think the other Jews were making it harder to cooperate with, with the converted Jews, so they needed extra help. And so a lot of what Paul did, the collections he made, were charity. And Paul was eager to do that, and you'll see that mentioned throughout the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So it's not like a tax where the government twists your arm and says, if you don't pay this tax, eventually we're going to send the IRS after you to go to jail. Well, that's not, you know, taxation is not charity. Um, God says, obviously he's not saying give more than you can afford to give, but whatever you think you want to give, do it gladly. Don't do it begrudgingly. In other words, if you don't, in other words, first you've got to learn to love your brother or at least care about them so that you aren't giving it in a begrudging manner. 
That's what God wants. Verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have abundance for every good work. What he's saying is God's going to bless you for being charitable. Now, I know the prosperity gospel people twist that stuff and use it so they can make money. Um, but the truth is, there are blessings when we are generous to other people. And a lot of times you don't see it. Like, you know, the Israelites, until Moses told them as they're getting ready to go in the promised land, he said, did you notice in the last 40 years your shoes never wore out and your clothes never wore out? They had never noticed it. It was just a smart minor blessing. I believe God gives us minor blessings. You know, he doesn't hit you over the head with a couple $10,000 check out of nowhere, you know. But he gives us minor blessings here and there, things that could have gone wrong that didn't go wrong that we don't see. But have faith that if you're charitable, God will bless you. That's what Paul is saying, and it's true. Uh, if you do the right thing, God will bless you. And blessing is not always money. It could come in other things as well. Uh, America has been the bastion of charity far and away, and I believe America has been blessed. Um, a man was asked by a charity worker if he would donate his used clothes to starving people around the world. They said, are you willing to give your used clothes to starving people around the world? And the man surprised said, no. He said, what do you mean, no? You're not using all those old clothes in your closet. I know I'm not, but no. But why not? He says, well, if they can use my old clothes, they're not starving. <laughs> Actually, I understand that. As I get a little smaller, my old clothes never mind, fall off me. Um, <clears throat> but that was his emphatic no. But really, you know, um, we should be willing to give old clothes. And over, they have a drive at Cape where they have old overcoats. And I'll just tell you a story. Um, when Natalie was volunteering at, at the elementary school near us, there was this kid that would come to school in the winter without a coat. And the teachers wanted to get a coat for him. But they discovered, and I don't know how they figured this out, if they bought him a new coat at Walmart, his mom was a druggie, she would take it right back to Walmart to get the cash. So it had to be a used coat. So we um, asked the, the faculty there at SEMO, it had to be a certain size to fit him. If anybody had one that could fit him, and there's a guy in our faculty who was a Mormon, and sure enough, he came up with a really great, I think it was a London fog coat, but it was several years old, so he couldn't take it back. And it's probably from a store that's not even around here in Cape to get the money back. And he was the only one out of a faculty of 20 that came through with the coat. We didn't have one of the right size. And I thought that was interesting. That's the kind of charity that I mean, a coat for a kid. And it also shows you how bad society is, that there is a mom who at least they believe if you got a new coat at Walmart or some place where they could look at the tag, they knew they could take it right back and, and get money and buy drugs for it. Um, and there are parents, and even in a few cases, grandparents that are that, the drugs have screwed them up. And you know, you look at these big cities with homeless people, um, at least in some cases I'm told, they actually have homeless shelters they were in because they're drug addicts and, and partially mentally ill, the two go together. They don't want to be in a shelter. They want to be out on the streets where they can shoot up drugs uh, as much as they want, and lay around in tents and panhandle for money and uh, whatever else they do, I don't know. Um, it sounds like me a terrible life, but we have a lot of people in this country that drugs have destroyed their minds, and maybe other bad things too. Uh, I remember, and it was the liberals who pushed this, um, they basically defunded most of the mental hospitals in America. These people have a right to be out on the streets. I, don't, I still don't understand that crazy decision. Uh, there are too many on the streets, and there are all kinds of places. Now, not around here, but if you go to a big city, like even Washington, D.C., 
in certain places. You can see them on TV. Rows and rows of bums. And um, they need help. In a way, they need help. And this is the part about charity that is discouraging. They need help, but in ways that we can't solve the problem. Because unless you have governmental power, you can't end some of the things that undermine prosperity. These people need to be treated for their mental illness. Uh, the, by the way, you know, fentanyl is now pouring across the border in tons. used to be in pounds, now it's in tons. As they, by the way, the drug deal is what they, um, and the guys and the, and the drug gangs that run the Mexican border, what they do is they send a stream of, of uh, immigrants, especially with children, toward Border Patrol, maybe in this direction. They know that'll tie them up so they won't be anywhere else. And then they send the ones who don't want to talk to Border Patrol because they're smuggling drugs or have criminal records, whatever. They send them that way. And uh, that, we don't actually know how many have entered America illegally. We know the ones that, that voluntarily give themselves up to Border Patrol so they can be sent all over America. Uh, but all that fentanyl pouring into America is just adding to the poverty problem and the dope problem. But there's probably nothing we can do about it. And, and that's true in a lot of other countries. They have other systemic problems. So a lot of people say, well, why should I give to charity? I get these things in the mail, uh, and I know that I could give money to all the poor countries, Haiti and Malaysia, and you know, whatever number places that you might want to mention, and it probably won't substantially change anything. And I have no answer, yes or no, for that. I, I have, I, and if you give to too many charities, they mail you more and more stuff. Like, I gave some to an Indian reservation once or twice. Now I get tons of stuff. And I, I'm not complaining, you know, that's just the way the world is. So I have no explanation for the problem. But I think the one thing we should do, whether you don't want to give into any more charities because you don't trust them, don't lose the spirit of generosity. And uh, I'm proud of my one son who does help the Salvation Army on a regular basis. He works there uh, Thanksgiving and meal stuff. And, um, and they traditionally do go to the worst parts of town and do help out. So um, keep that spirit. I wish I had a good explanation for how to handle charities, because you know some of them they have uh, their administrative cost is high. It's like a profit game for the managers. It is, it's a problem. But I do think we should still try to keep the generous spirit, whatever you choose to do um, with your money. Now, my last scripture is um, Ephesians 4.27. In Ephesians 4.27, uh, Paul says, Nor give place to the devil. It's interesting that he says that nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor. So why, now the fact that he's writing this to one of the biggest churches means some of the church people might have been tempted. Uh, we know from other scriptures to not work, to uh, kind of bum off others, maybe to steal a little bit, because maybe in their society, uh, it wasn't considered unethical. By the way, do you know pagan religions did not teach moral laws? Now, they did have ethics. The Romans had ethics, at least when Rome was strong. But, there, but they had a, plan, a pantheon of religions and gods, and those religions did not teach moral law. I was shocked when I heard some historians say that. Uh, and, and many of their gods had all kind of weird affairs and jealousies and infighting. And, you know, if you read about Mount Olympus in Greece and all the infights between, well, the, the, the various gods had different names and different cultures, but you know the ones I mean, uh, Saturn and Jupiter and Mercury and Olympus and Aphrodite and whoever I may have forgotten to mention, Diana. Uh, it almost sounds like a soap opera, but I think they, some of them had ethics, like the Roman Empire, they had certain ethics. But they weren't taught ethics in that culture. So Paul maybe had to tell them, look, you can't be stealing, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him 
who has need. In other words, you should be out there working so that you can help the needy. That's what he's saying. Don't fall for the devil's trap. The devil's trap is they're going to not do anything and kind of sponge off or bum off everybody else. He says you should be working not just to take care of yourself and your family, of course that goes without saying, but so you can help the needy. And what scares me, I, I'm not certain this will happen, but um, you know in the COVID relief bills, they've allowed, depends on if people know how to play the game and ask for this or that and the others, a lot of people have dropped out of the labor force because they get at least enough money free and I think it's scheduled to go up through the end of this month without working. The reason we have a labor shortage is not because there aren't enough workers, because some of them decided, hey, my job is hard and tough. I don't think I like my boss. I just stay home and, and play video games and watch Netflix and binge out and eat fast food. And, but is that really falling for the devil's trap? Is that really good for the Americans? And if they get this new bigger bill with four or five trillion more to spend, are they going to extend that more? Because if I were the devil, if I'm saying if I were the devil, I would say, I want more people to not do. Any, I mean, people that are young and healthy and able to work. I'm not talking about retired people or or disabled people or women that got too many kids and you know. But I want people that could work. I want them to become lazy, spoiled, like the famous rabble of Rome. Well, you know, the Roman Empire near the end, they had so many freebies that the inner city people in Rome, they call the rabble of Rome, became so decadent they couldn't be part of the Roman legions anymore. And Rome had to rely more and more on mercenaries. You see the trap in that, don't you? And that's one of the reasons Rome fell, not the only reason. In other words, people not working and helping each other, but living off others, is a spiritual trap. It's a spiritual trap. And it has ruined a lot of people in the inner cities in America and other countries too, just like it did for Rome. And. Um, so God's advice would be the work so that you can help others. And God's ways are best. And God's way, I'm going to oversimplify it, but God's way is this. It's better to give than to receive. It's better to give than to receive.